All right, I started a new video to get rid of that timer out of the corner because it was bugging me. <clears throat> Another thing RESPA has is this thing called the Home Loan Toolkit. It is kind of a gee whiz thing that helps the consumer understand all of what we just talked about. It is a, uh, it's a toolkit. It's on the, uh, the CFPB's website, which allows the homeowner to go in and understand you know, the three-day process. It helps them understand what the loan estimate form is, all of that, okay? RESPA violates unearned fees, kickbacks. Now, I've said this three times. Might be an important factor, you think, okay? Another thing RESPA now has is this thing called the Mortgage Disclosure Improvement Act. What this does is it will record all of the people that are involved in this closing. It's going to record the real estate agent's license number. It may record the mortgage broker's license number. It may record the title company's license number. That way, if there's ever an issue, we can go back and see who was involved in that process to figure out, okay, where's the responsibilities lie? What title company closed this? Well, we got their license number. All of these things, all right? That is just the law to present, uh, prevent the consumer from receiving low interest rates on appli applications because they are all required to disclose all of this stuff to the consumer. Now, when it comes to preparing the closing statement, this is where we are going to have some fun today, all right? It's really simplistic math, but I'm telling you, people get confused with this, but it is really simplistic math because everything on that closing disclosure is either a debit or a credit. That's it. Everything has to be a debit, meaning it's a charge. It's someone must pay this, or it is a credit in the form of something in a person's favor. I'm getting credit for this. So everything on that closing disclosure is nothing more than a buyer's debit or credit and a seller's debit or credit. In the buyer's case, if the debits mean charges are greater than their credits, they must bring money to the table. Think about that. If you don't get it, hit pause for a second. If the buyer's debits, meaning they owe more than they get credit for, the buyer must bring money to the table. And conversely, the seller will have his debits and credits uh, totaled. If his credits are more than his debits, this is money the seller will receive. And the biggest credit to the seller is what? The sales price of the house. There have only been a handful of cases in my career where the seller's debits were bigger than his credits, meaning the seller had to bring money to the table. I'm not saying it can't happen because it most certainly can. It is very rare. So the buyer's debits are more than their credits. They bring money to the table, which is what you see. Buyers got to bring money. The seller's credits are higher than their debits. They receive money at the closing. And all, that's literally all we're going to do is add up each one's debits and their credits and determine the, do they bring money to the table or do they get money at the table? Now, there are several types of expenses that are incurred. Now, I want to warn you on the exam. Please do not read into the exam because I'm going to tell you that theoretically, every one of these expenses can be negotiated between a buyer and a seller. However, there is a specific 
standard on these expenses as to who pays it. So when you see a test question that's going to ask you something about who pays the commission, I do not want you to come to me and go, well, you know, if they would have negotiated, the question didn't say that. Don't read into it. All right. So in the broker's commission, who reads or who pays the broker's commission? The seller pays the broker's commission, right? Because it's part of the listing agreement and the listing agent said, I'm going to charge you 6%. And remember, they're going to split it. I'm going to keep 3% and I'm going to give 3% to the selling agent in order to entice him to bring me a buyer. So even though it may show up on both sides of the column as a buyer and a seller, it's actually paid for by the seller. Attorney's fees. Well, there is an attorney that works for the title company. And because the uh, title company represents both the buyer and seller, meaning they work for both of them, that attorney's fee is probably split 50-50. Now, this is probably one of my biggest uh, pet peeves, and I told you I numbered these, and you guys need to understand this. There is a difference between these two words. There's, people will talk about closing costs. When you go to close, there is a fee called the closing fee. And this is the one that is typically split 50-50. And on the Indiana Purchase Agreement, on the Virginia Purchase Agreement, this is a section that is listed directly in there that says that the buyer and seller agree to split the closing fee 50-50. And what happens is the seller goes, no, dude, I ain't paying half of the buyer's closing costs. That's not what it said. Closing costs are this generic made up term that is the total of all of the fees combined. You've got a closing fee, a recording fee, a courier fee. All right. So you will often have to explain, no, Mr. Seller. That is not saying that you're going to pay half of their closing costs. There is one fee inside of those costs that you will split. This is because the title company works for both the buyer and the seller. So you split that fee 50-50. That is the most common thing. Now, once again, could be negotiated. There are recording fees. Each party has their own recording fees, right? The new buyer wants to record the IOU and the mortgage because the bank told them they had to. The seller wants to record the release of their lien because they're going to pay it off with the money the buyer's giving them. Some states have a transfer tax, which is typically paid for by the seller. There are title fees. Remember, we talked about the owner's policy and the lender's policy. So each one has that. Then there's a group here that typically is, oh, let me go this way. Paid for by the buyer. Obviously, right? The buyer gets the loan. So the loan fees, the buyer has to put money in those impound accounts. So those are buyer fees. The lender requires the buyer to pay for an appraisal, so that's a buyer's fee. The survey, the lender wants to see, so the buyer's going to have to pay that. And then there could be any kind of additional fees that are involved. Could be a survey in there, uh, uh, a different type of survey. There could be any kind of other fees that could be associated. Now, there is a problem in the fact that there are some fees that must be prorated between the buyer and the seller. Prorated means there's a division of that fee 
because of whatever it is, can be divided. The two most common ones are real estate taxes. And I'm going to say the other one is homeowners associations. A good example is uh, another is the fuel in an oil tank, right? Because when the seller took or the buyer took over, it was half full. So there are some items that have to be prorated. The two most common items that I told you are real estate taxes and HOA fees. Real estate taxes, because they are paid on an annual basis and HOA fees, which typically are paid on an annual basis. Even if they're paid on a monthly basis, they could be prorated because you're going to close at some date in the middle of the month. All right. So proration is nothing more than a division of this fee so that it can be appropriated some of it to the buyer and some of it to the seller. How do we do that? Here comes the fun with math today. So let's talk about the, these types of fees. The first thing you need to know is there are two styles. There is what we call a prepaid fee. And then there is what is called an accrued fee. A prepaid fee is paid before you use it. An accrued fee is paid after you use it. Now, here's the good thing on the exam. You are not going to be required to know that taxes are prepaid or they're accrued. Doesn't matter. Because all prepaid bills act alike. It doesn't matter what the bill is. It could be prepaid cellular. It could be your HOA that's prepaid. It could be your real estate taxes that are prepaid. So you are not going to be required to know which specific bill is either prepaid or accrued. Because also, that may be different in every state. So understand that the exam will say, using a prepaid bill, that's all you really need to know. Because it doesn't matter what it is, it only matters that it was paid before. Or it may say using an accrued bill. Once again, doesn't matter. It was accrued means it's paid at the end. So let's look at a couple examples. And I often find this math is kind of hard to understand. So let's do some simple math. Let's say, and here's my month. First day of the month, 30th day of the month. Let's say there is some prepaid bill. Well, Raymond, what bill is it? Doesn't matter. All you need to know it's prepaid, which means what? It's paid before you use it. So this bill was actually paid on the first. All right. And I'm going to make it real easy math for us. And let's say that bill is $210. Well, what kind of bill is it? Doesn't matter. It's prepaid. That's all we need. Now, we're going to close this property on the 20th of the month. So what happens in a scenario where it has to be prorated is the fact that the seller owned the property, right? On the first, but he only, but he paid for 30 days of usage because the bill showed up at his house and said, hey, before you use this item, you must pay $210. So the seller prepaid the $210 for all 30 days. But he only used it 
20 days. The buyer, who is going to be the new owner, used it 10 of those days. So he has to pay the seller some money because the seller needs to get reimbursed for the number of days. This is the buyer side of this chart. So the buyer is going to credit the seller 10 days of this, which is how much? $70. If that bill was $210 and it was determined that's what, $7 a day? Seven times 30 is 210. That's why I picked easy math right now. You would divide that 210 by the 30 days and go, oh, that's $7 a day. And the buyer has got to reimburse the seller for 10 days. 10 days times $7 a day is $70. So that seller gets a credit of $10. Where does that money come from? Well, there's only two people in this. I'm not going to pay it. You're not going to pay it. The title company. So the buyer has a debit of $70. So if I could wave my magic wand here for a second. And this $100,000 house. And this is the only bill. I'm waving a magic wand for a second. This is the only bill. That buyer is going to spend $100,010. $100 for the house. And he has to give the seller $10 for the last 10 days of whatever this is that the seller prepaid at the beginning of the month. And conversely, the seller is going to walk away with $100,010. That $100,000 is the credit to him for the purchase price of the house. Plus he gets back $10 for something he's not going to use. So he is going to get a credit of $100,010, okay? This is how the proration would happen for a prepaid bill. Now, I'm going to change the story because I do that all the time, right? And we have our 30 days. We've got the seller side here and the buyer side just so we can see it. And we're going to close on the 11th day. And we're going to use the same numbers just to help you out. All of a sudden now, there is an accrued bill that's due when? At the end of the month. And we are too going to make this a $210 bill which is still that same $7 a day, just for reference, all right? But now let's talk about this. <clears throat> because it's paid at the end of the month, who is actually going to write the check? Well, at the end of the month, who is the homeowner? The buyer will write the check. So this check will get written here. And how much will that check be for? It will be for $210. The company doesn't care. All they know is whatever this is has been used this entire month and they want paid. So they are going to send the new owner on the 30th, which in this case is the buyer, a check or a bill for $210,000 or $210. <laughs> for $210, sorry, for $210. And he's going to have to pay it. But 
He's only used it 19 days. The seller used it the first 11 days. So he has to settle up with the buyer so that the buyer has enough money at the end of the month. How much is he going to settle up? Well, it's 11 days of usage at $7 a day. The seller is going to get debited $77 for that. And he is going to give a credit to the buyer of $77. And what the buyer will do is take that money that he received at closing and he is going to add it to his $134 that he's used, $133, which is going to add up to $210, and then he will write the check. So in this particular case, the seller gets a debit. So now, let's pretend it's a mythical $100,000 house. The buyer only has to bring $99,923 to closing because he is getting a credit of 77. That makes a hundred grand. And the seller is going to walk away with $99,223 because he gets a hundred for the credit of the house but he has to give back 77 for this pre, uh, accrued bill, whatever it is. All right. So there's an easy way to look at this. Here's who gets the debits and the credits. Let's look at this. You've got a prepaid and then you've got this accrued. Here's the way to remember for me. The most common way is who's writing the check. In the accrued method, the buyer's writing the check, he will get a credit at the closing table. In the prepaid, the seller wrote it at the beginning, therefore he gets the credit. See that? So now, what I just said, hint, 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 I can tell you what kind of bill it is simply based on who got the credit. If the seller got the credit for the money at the closing table, that's prepaid. If the buyer got the credit at the closing table, that's an accrued bill. And that's how this works, all right? And it is either added to what the debit's gotta bring, or it could be subtracted because the buyer's debit is what? A hundred thousand because he's paying for it, but he gets a credit of 77 back. So the debits minus his credits, what I told you is what the buyer has to bring to the table. This is debits minus credits equal what the buyer brings. In this scenario, here are the credits, which is the price of the house minus the debit he owes, this is what the seller receives. This is simply how this is done, all right? Now, I would suggest that you do some of the questions down here because there are examples to help you do this. A credit, and it's all right here. Here's the arithmetic that we just went through. Now, let me do one other example because I want to try and help you with a hint. This is an example of maybe where the bill was prorated over a month. There are some bills like maybe HOAs or taxes where this proration may be a year's proration. So here you have January 1 and here you have December 31. Now, I have mentioned before that this exam is designed for you to answer questions in a minute. 
all right, in a minute. So there may be some tricks that you need to be aware of. In an example like this, where it's a year proration, let's use the example number one. It closes on June the 30th. And the bill is $618. Well, the first thing you're going to do is panic because you're going to figure, well, dude, I don't know how many days from January the 1st to June the 30th is. How many, you got, the, what, what is that old trick about uh, September 30 days has a, a, I don't want to remember that. And I won't have a calendar, but what can I recognize about June the 30th? It is half a year. So you can do the math on these exams and get very, very close by realizing that the proration on this, first of all, it's prepaid. So who's going to get the credit? Who wrote the check? The seller did. So the seller is going to get a credit and they closed at half a year. He's going to get a credit of $309, approximately. So the exam will say something like a credit of approximately 309. Now it may be $308.54, but the exam is not going to ask you that. We just did that proration very quickly because we realized the trick on June the 30th was half a year. That is a very common trick for them. The other common trick they love to do, let's do a second example. It's going to close September 15th. Well, now you're even more confused because I don't know how many days that is, but we realize that the 15th is half a month, right? So you've got January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, eight and a half months. This is the trick. That time frame is eight and a half months. Out of how many? Out of 12. Now you can figure that and go, look, it's 618 times the percentage of whatever eight and a half divided by 12 is. And you go to your Siri calculator and go, hey, Siri, what's eight and a half divided by 12? <clears throat> this is about 70% of the way through. All right. Hey, Siri, what's 70% of 618? Times 618 is 432.6. So what you get is the proration is $432.60. If it was a uh, prepaid, then the seller is going to get a credit of money. Now, what I just figured actually was how much did the seller use? The seller is going to get a credit for this amount. So I hope I didn't mislead you. Understand that this is how much the seller used, eight and a half months, 30%, 70%. So the seller will actually get a credit of 30%. Hey, Siri, what's $618 times 30%? Right? Because he used eight and a half percent, he gets this amount of money back. Well, if this percentage that I did the math on here was 70, then this percentage is ballpark 30. And when you take $618 
times that 30%, you know the seller is going to get a credit of $185 and that debit is going to come from the buyer from that same amount because prepaid credit always goes to the seller. So if you have questions, I want you to email me on this and we can go over it. But you, that's what you really need to determine. But watch for these tricks. And most of the time, they're almost always half a month or half the year. Here, this half was 309 he used, but he still got the credit for 309 because it was half. All right. Once again, If you have questions, feel free to email me. I'm at Raymond at realuniversity.com. This was the chapter entitled the closing or the settlement. Uh, I would do some of those problems down there. If you have uh, ways, you guys can go out to chat GPT and ask questions. I actually have a handbook that I have written that will help you pass or ace the real estate exam if you want to go searching in our library of professional books that you might get that will help you build questions. I actually have the chat GPT prompts in there for you. And you may ask yourself or you may ask it to create some sample proration questions. All right. Once again, email me, Raymond at realuniversity.com. I'll see you on the next chapter.